Folks, welcome to the TIPS PlantSnap webinar. TIPS is the Technology and Innovation Professionals uh, uh, community within the APGA. And we are your guides and connection to technology and other innovative solutions. Um, the committee right now is made up of myself from the Arnold. Uh, Carissa Doherty is my vice chair from the Morton. Christina Salvador from Santa Fe Botanical is our able uh, connector with the association. And Ken Anon from the association is our main contact. Uh, PlantSnap has been a vital project that my predecessors have been involved with for at least the last couple of years. And it's really sort of a, a fabulous pilot of how the association can bring technology solutions uh, broadly to every garden. And they're very graciously here to give us more details about how uh, that works, what it means for all of us, what they get, what we get, and uh, how everybody can win. So I'm going to pass it over to uh, the association team. Great. Thank you very much. Um, this is an exciting time for us as we uh, are exploring this uh, great partnership that we have with PlantSnap. And what we want to do today is kind of give you the overview of how this came about and then talk a little bit about some of the work, work that Denver Botanic Garden has been doing. Um, and then have PlantSnap talk a little bit more about what, what the app is about um, following with a call to action so that you know, um, and then we are gonna give plenty of time for Q and A. So um, the brief history of this partnership, um, it, it's very interesting. Um, and what we wanna do is explore both why we wanted to get into this um, and what are the benefits that um, not only your garden, but the association Plant snap and your visitors get from that as well. So uh, the first thing is that um, the, the tips, this is actually coming from the tips community. And this is something that tips had begun doing in um, since 2017 researching plant identification apps. And the Denver Botanic Garden um, uh, began working with plant snap um, on plant identification and improving um, the accuracy um, this has been something Gavin uh, Cuthbertson and his team were working on. And um, a, a, very, a good amount of time, about a year or so, had gone into it. And the uh, president of Denver Botanic brought it to the attention of the association team by saying this is really worth um, looking at to explore some larger ramifications of the work done here. And what this did is uh, very much tie into the strategic goals of uh, of the association, which we are now coming across um, this strategic plan 2024, which you're going to be hearing much more about in 2020. But uh, one of the main themes that we began working on last year was garden resilience. Um, and for many of you, you may have been familiar with the uh, with the uh, uh, the Garden to Garden Disaster Response Center which was a response to many of our gardens who had suffered a, a lot of uh, climate events. And uh, we were asked to help um, in, in some way respond to that. And we created a platform within go. our Climate and Sustainability um, Alliance partner uh, program to connect, uh, connect gardens with resources. And from there, we actually built a mobile fundraising platform to provide gardens who wanted to run that kind of response. Um, and we have a lot of other resilience projects that we want to explore coming up in the next five years. So really focusing on how do we build, how do public gardens build personal hey. and planetary resilience really became a theme we worked on in 2019, exploring um, with, uh, with National Public Gardens Week being sort of a out, being a touch point between um, that messaging and the, the end user, the garden visitors. Um, in order to do that, though, we wanted to amplify the resource capacity of our association to bring that. And in doing so, we wanted to bring um, strategic partnerships to bear to, uh, to help us um, extend our reach further. Um, and these partnerships um, would bring about revenue generating opportunities uh, for the association, ultimately. 
um, but also to provide a lot of benefits to the gardens and all, and all participants in these partnerships. We wanted a, a four-way win and all of that. So beginning in 2019, the National Public Gardens Week really began to, we put out, um, as you know, this, this past year, we evolved National Public Gardens Day to a National Public Gardens Week. And we kicked off the new format with the theme of resilience and asked gardens to really think about programming um, activity during that week to raise awareness for public gardens as um, resilience builders. How do they build that personal community or planetary resilience? And um, at that point, um, we had also begun talks with uh, PlantSnap uh, as a potential partner in that. And so they were very, they were an early, um, an early uh, participant um, as a partner with National Public Gardens Week in exploring um, what that could mean um, for garden visitors. Um, and uh, Denver's going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The partnership itself, um, we're, not, we're going to go into very, very um, high level detail on this today in the webinar, but you can access all of this information on the Plant Snap uh, portion of our website that describes this partnership in detail. And we actually have a, a PDF, um, which is the image that you see on the right, that is um, that explores that a little bit more. Um, in essence, they're, 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 the, the parts are very simple. The goal oh, is oh, there. to be a database of plant yeah. in the world and plant you know plants. PlantSnap very much definitely wants to um, be a, a wonderful yeah. resource. Everyone who has a curiosity okay. about plants. We also, um, in order to do that, we're inviting public gardens to participate by sharing lists and inviting uh, visitors to yeah. download the app um, with uh, unique to your garden download link and use it in your garden or anywhere they travel. And we can yeah. go into more detail about that, but one of the goals of participation is that um, this is a, a key to really making this partnership sing. And that as visitors download the app with the unique download link, um, which comes about when gardens begin participating and going through some of the steps to set that up, um, a per percentage of revenue is gonna be generated to the association to support this Garden to Garden Disaster Response Center and the activities that we are going to be um, hopefully doing in the next several years to amplify our impact um, that we can provide to gardens to respond um, and recover um, from various climate events. So in, in the free or paid version, um, there's um, activity generates um, a revenue uh, event. So um, more detail can be in this uh, document. Um, and if you have further questions, you can, um, you can reserve those and we can answer more detail. I'm going to just stop. Um, I've gotten a note here that says um, if you are getting a lot of background information to the background noise to just mute, um, mute your phone. Thanks very much. Um, one of the benefits of being able to generate this unique download link is that um, those people who are visiting um, your garden um, and using this app um, with the download link um, information is being captured about what they're doing in your garden. And this is something we would like to then offer you as a participating garden the opportunity to look at some of that data. Um, I think it will give very in interesting insights into your visitors activity, what they're taking photos of, where are they going? How much time are they spending in the parts of your garden? Um, where are gaps that might be in your garden in, ter in interpretation? Um, Again, the very fundamental question Eric Rawls, um, who is the CEO of PlantSnap, said is the number one question most people uh, get asked at at gardens is, what plant is that? And so we're operating from a very basic response to say, here's something that we can offer you um, to provide your visitors. Um, and in turn, there is data that can be collected that you can use. Now, this is aggregate data. It's not um, detailed data that is going to um, violate any privacy issues, but it's going to be important data for you for visitor services. Um, 
for interpretive staff. And, um, and also the data collected about the plants themselves. Um, we want to be part of the longer, larger conversation about conservation and um, providing data about the plants that are found, um, not only in your garden, but around the world, we're part of a larger conversation and a larger effort in conservation. We want to be able to provide um, this information to gardens to be able to use for plant research or other purposes. So um, we feel that the, the components of this partnership are really speaking to opportunities that your garden can benefit from, um, PlantsNet benefits by, by being able to grow its database um, and enrich its database tremendously and improve the algorithm for identification. And for the association for really finding that um, good partnership with um, to build resilience um, that benefits all of us. So with that, what I want to do is turn it over to Denver because they were sort of first out of the gate with their experience with PlantsNet. Great. Thank you, Joan. And hello, everyone. This is Dan Domagala from the Denver Botanic Gardens. I'm joined with uh, Cindy Newlander, who's our Associate Director of Horticulture. So we'll just give you a brief uh, kind of overview of our experience with uh, PlantSnap here at the Denver Botanic Gardens. Um, we've been working with PlantSnap for probably about a year and a half. Uh, started off as a way to uh, further our mission of connecting people with plants, especially um, through use of mobile devices. Uh, so um, Gavin Culbertson, uh, which was heavily involved in TIPS um, before he moved on to another position, um, he uh, gathered some momentum, worked very closely with the, uh, with the PlantSnap team uh, to uh, kind of try it out. Uh, we had uh, several volunteers and uh, a few visitors um, use the tool uh, early on, and um, we were finding, um, uh, well, we were having some fun with it, but we were also finding the uh, accuracy rate um, was not as high as we'd maybe hope early on, uh, maybe in the 50% range as far as taking a picture and identifying plant, uh, plant from that picture. So in order to improve that, uh, we uploaded uh, our plant list, our full plant list here at the, at the gardens. And that's where uh, Cindy, our horticulturist, um, can kind of talk about the process of, uh, uh, of doing that. So Cindy, if you're on. Yes, um, so for the process we went through to upload our list was pretty simplified. Um, I pretty much, in the course of sitting down with Gavin in about 20 minutes, uh, pulled a list of all of our uh, species cultivars that um, are at our different sites and just put them into an Excel uh, spreadsheet file and we submitted that up to PlantSnap. Um, uh, we, uh, we use BG Base here so we made use of just a pretty simple export to pull all of our um, names out. Um, after the names got imported into the plant snap um, data file. They did send us back a list of, of uh, species which they were hoping to get some more images of. That's something we haven't been able to address um, as of yet at this time. So the, um, after we uploaded our uh, plant list from here at the gardens, we found our uh, accuracy rate went up to over 90%. So the tool um, uh, became much more useful, much more accurate, uh, and it's, uh, it was from the work that Cindy and, uh, and others did to, um, to get that plant list up to the plant snap people. We've also found here at the gardens that involving other departments, uh, whether it's visitor services, um, our volunteer teams, uh, or our marketing teams, um, uh, the more we, uh, we've been able to raise awareness that the tool is there and available for visitors to use, the, um, the more traction we're seeing as far as, uh, as people using it and getting some good comments from the use of that. One particular thing that I'll mention um, before I'll turn it back over, on the uh, raising awareness side, um, our volunteers uh, and some of our docents, um, they've been briefed on, the, uh, on, on PlantSnap as a tool. Uh, and so when they get those questions in the gardens, like Joan was saying, hey, what is this plant? Or I'd like to know more about this. Um, if a volunteer or a, a docent happens to be nearby, uh, and they may not know the information on that plant, um, it's good to, uh, it, it, it's good for them to let the uh, patrons know, hey, here's a, uh, here's a plant snap application uh, that you can uh, not only identify this plant, but other plants within the gardens and, and get more information about it. So that's been a good way to, um, uh, to again, raise the level of awareness and let our visitors know that uh, 
if you're interested in learning more about plants and uh, you want to make use of your mobile device, this uh, plant map is a great way to do that. So I think with that, I'll turn it over to the uh, plant snap team. Uh, either Stuart or Eric uh, can guide us through a little bit about the app and maybe a quick tour of it. Hello, everybody. This is Eric Rawls, and um, I'm the founder of Plant Snap. I came up with this idea back in 2012. Uh, never really a plant person, but I was at a friend's barbecue and we were playing cornhole and Every time I would go up to throw the cornhole, I would staring at this awesome flower. And no one knew what it was. I wasn't even a plant guy, but I was really curious about this flower. So I couldn't figure out, okay, how do you determine what type of plant you're looking at? And I went to Google and tried to do a Google search and that didn't help me. And then I spoke to a friend who's into plants and he says, well, you have to go buy a bunch of plant books and carry them around. So that was in 2012 and every year seems like, oh my God, this is the peak of technological civilization. How in 2012 can we not know what the name of a plant is unless you're a botanist? So at that point, it got my wheels turning. I've always been in tech. I've had websites for the last 20 years, science websites. I'm just a big science nerd. And I made it, I had to figure out how to build an app that would identify a plant with a picture, like a Star Trek tricorder. And started off to get this done thinking, oh, I know how to do technology, no problem. And it turned out to be a huge problem. <laughs> First of all, I didn't know how many plants there were. And second of all, image recognition wasn't there yet. So I wasted a lot of money and about a year trying to get it done and realized the technology was a long way away. So fast forward to 2016, I had already started a new venture. I was able to get hold of the earth.com domain, which for a science nerd is the pinnacle of success. I thought, all right, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, educate the world about the environment, and uh, that'll be that. And so I got that built, and then I read an article about artificial intelligence and machine learning, and it sounded like perfect fit for plant snap and I gave it one last shot and turns out it worked so I got it working with a hundred plants and then it scaled to a thousand and then it scaled to ten thousand and then I knew like all right I think that uh, we can make this happen and uh, launched it in July 2017 a US only English only with about 50,000 species had no idea if anyone but me cared about using an app to identify a plant. Uh, it was just a, I just needed to build this app. It was just became a, I was obsessed with it. And so I built it and thankfully people did care and it did really well. And over the next year, we expanded it to English and added it, got up to about 300,000 plants and in the database and so that it would work all around the world for people who spoke English. And then it really started taking off. So we decided, all right, um, only about 10% of the world speaks English. I'm sure that the other 90% also like plants. So now we've got to translate it. So in the summer of 2018, we translated it into 37 languages and uh, built freemium versions. It started out as a paid app and then we have now added a free Android version and a free um, iOS version. And now in about the last year and a half, we have went from one and a half million installs to now close to 35 million installs. By the end of the year, we should cross that plateau. And uh, it's used, like I said, in 37 languages and every day used in literally 200, over 200 countries around the world already. So now it's become like, wow, this is, we can do great things with this. We can help the planet. Um, we can literally map every plant species on earth if we have enough people 
out there snapping photos of plants, both at gardens and just when they're walking around, everyone likes to play with their phones. So uh, we've learned that this is just another thing that a person can do with their phone and they like doing it. We've got about 500,000 snaps a day right now being taken all over the world. And if I could show you my screen, um, there's an interactive map on plantsnap.com that you can go to called the Explore Map. And there's literally not a country on the planet that you can go, that you can zoom in on and not find plant snap photos. We keep them up there every um, 30 days worth of snaps all around the world, just so you can see the distribution that the app has already. So this partnership with APGA, we've been working on it for a long time. And it seems like the perfect way for us to get the app in the hands of plant lovers to people who think like us and who want to contribute to uh, the environment and to, to the societal movement to protect the environment and the ecosystem and protect plants. And all they have to do is take photos with this app. Um, the, part, the gardens come into play by helping us distribute the app through a media kit that we'll give you that has pre-made marketing materials. You can choose to use them or not. You have a specific code that a person would click a link or scan the QR code and it would take them to the app store to download it. And at that point, those installs become attributed to your garden or your association. And we would then provide you with demographic information. What I've learned is that most gardens that we've spoken to don't have demographic information on their users. Oh, I can share my screen now. Thanks, Joan. You're welcome. Can everybody see it? Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, I hope so. Joan, can you? I can. Okay, good. Um, so back to what we can offer the gardens in exchange for helping us spread this around the world. So this is our explore map. And Dan was just speaking about the Denver Botanic Garden. So if you go to the explore map and zoom into the Denver Botanic Garden, you'll find a little pin that we put in the map for all APGA associated gardens. Um, and there's Denver. So we can literally zoom into the Denver garden and see the distribution of plant photos that have been, that are taken inside the garden. So what this does, it, it helps Dan know where people are spending the most time in his garden, what they, what displays they like. They really like it right there, whatever that is, Dan. So <clears throat> as all of the images taken at your garden and that would help you understand which parts of the garden people like. Plus, I've also learned that most gardens don't have photos of all their uh, plants, and we are happy to share them with you. On top of that, we give you basic demographic information about all of your visitors, and here's a sample of what that would look like. Uh, we remove all personally identifiable information from uh, a segment that we've create from your garden users. We're able to then upload the IP or the uh, machine or the phone ID and lump them all together for a particular location and find out this demographic information through a partnership we have with a third party. You know the age, gender, household income, affinity, if they have affinities towards certain things propensity to buy on the internet, children in the household, and where they came from. Where are these garden visitors coming from to your garden? Uh, so on top of the images that people take, we provide you with demographic information to do with what you please. And uh, also you would be contributing to this, what has become a global effort to now identify and map and evaluate the health of every plant species on earth, which seemed like an improbable task just a year ago, but now it's something that we can accomplish in just two years uh, with your help. So a game I like to play is 
stump plant snap. So you can zoom in literally on the explore map, any country on the planet that you want to. Let's try the Democratic Republic of Congo. I just want to show you how far around the world that this app has spread so far with very little marketing and very little distribution. It's being used all over. So in Kananga DRC, people are using it. And in Liang, in Malawi, I wonder if there's anyone using it in Lalongwe, Malawi. Yes, lots of people are using it in just the furthest corners of the earth that you can imagine. And then of course, populated areas like you would expect places like Australia and Melbourne to use it quite a bit, and they do. So <clears throat> our plant information, and we've got roughly 250 million images now taken by people all over the planet. And this information is going to be packaged up and available to scientists and academic organizations. And what they're gonna be able to do with this information is um, help the planet in, in just an unlimited number of ways. I've heard so many different ideas from scientists on how they plan to use this data that we're helping them provide. So it's a three-pronged thing that you're helping us do. You're helping us uh, it, with this global citizen scientist initiative. I certainly did not expect this app to become what it has become. But now that it has, I feel like it's my responsibility to get the most out of it that I possibly can in terms of helping the environment. And we all know that we're not getting a lot of help in this country right now with uh, environmental protection. And to make learning about nature fun, to cure plant blindness, which I recently learned is a condition. People walk around every day and don't notice plants because they are so used to, so busy and wrapped up in their everyday lives. They'll walk by plants and flowers constantly and never even notice they're there, much less understand how important they are to the overall ecosystem and health of the earth. We wouldn't be here without plants. Uh, so on, on top of helping the planet in that regard, we would provide you with demographics for your garden and all of the images that are taken in your garden. And you'll have a dashboard that's gonna look something like this. Um, the template is, this is just, a, it's gonna look a little bit like this. this is another one that we use, but it'll have a link where all of the images will be and when they were taken and what they are. And it'll, we're gonna remove the names of the people who take it because that's a privacy violation. And over here, it'll have a link that you push for demographics and um, then there'll be a link for your marketing materials. We'll, work, we'll put your, uh, we think it's the best approach to getting people onboarded is through digital marketing. If you have email databases or social media presence uh, or online ticketing that you could put a code on or and when you do online ticketing, they send you an email receipt. You could put a blurb in the email about it. But getting people on board before they come to your garden uh, is the best idea so that they're not fiddling around with it while they're there and asking people for help. They want to, we want them to know how to use it when they get there already. And uh, Dan's using, he's got a lot of great volunteers that are helping people and bringing it to their attention if they ask questions. So even if you have your plants labeled already, which most people, most gardens do, or most gardens don't have all of them labeled, but even if you do have them labeled, you can still use PlantSnap to get more information about any plant that's in your garden because the app provides you with basic details plus the taxonomy and plant care information. Uh, we also recently added a social media component so that people of people who share an interest in plants and the environment and just love our love nature and love the earth can all get together and share photos and 
chat about plant care. Uh, it's just, it's just, be, it's really become way more than I ever expected it to be, and now I want to use it to help. Um, that was a long rambling way to say thank you for listening and entertaining this partnership possibility. Eric, before you end, can you talk about the different ways gardens can become involved? There's different levels. Uh, yes, there's, well, one level is you give us your, if you would just like us to include or make sure that at this point we have 600,000 plants in the database. But if you want to make sure that we've got all of your plants from your garden included and trained in our database, you can send us an Excel file with the species name. We retrain the algorithm every month with images taken by users all around the world. So the app gets smarter every month. But if it doesn't have a plant in it, then it will not get the right answer if a plant is photographed. So level one is just giving us your plant species list and we'll be more than happy to train any plants that we do, have not already done in our next session. So anyone who's already got the app will have success at your garden. Uh, number two is uh, to, Stuart, are you, what is the number two? I can't remember off the top of my head. I can jump in. So yeah. um, currently the default is that you participate where you are already on the map, <clears throat> your coordinates would show up on the map because you're in a, you know, an association member garden and we know your location. So when you go over the map um, using the app, the garden is already identified. So that's just the default. If there's any garden in particular who does not want to even appear on the map, they can let us know and we'll make sure they don't show up at all. <clears throat> the next level, as, as Eric was describing, is to upload the plant list. And these can be done at any level you want. You can, you can do it all, you can do one component of it. Um, but then what we really would like to, have, to see happen is that each garden promotes PlantSnap either on their you know, digital signage or paper brochures. Uh, most effectively is in an email or an electronic ticketing. We have found that people really would rather download ahead of time. Once they get to the garden, they just want to get out to the garden and see the beautiful plants and flowers. They don't want to first start downloading and learning PlantSnap. So if they can, if it can be promoted ahead of time, they're much more likely to, to do it and to use it. <clears throat> and what that does is as we were talking about, it does give, uh, you know, there are some of the proceeds that go back, a portion of the proceeds go back to the association for, um, you know, emergency preparedness. And the other thing it does is when we were talking about machine learning, the more people that are snapping these photos, the better that the machine learning can uh, respond. Just like you hear about self-driving cars, they need to train those cars for almost every possible scenario. So the more people that take pictures of plants, you know, because plants vary so much depending on time of year, depending on a uh, wind that's blowing, whether they're budding or flowering or nothing, uh, what kind of bark they have. So the more people that take pictures, the more the, the machine learning algorithm can recognize any plant depending on a whole variety of conditions. So uh, it's in the brochure, it's up on the association website, it's up on the um, PlantSnap website, describing what level you wanna participate at. And if you reach out to us, we'll, we'll talk you more through this and determine what might be the best level to, to participate at. Yeah, we, we, we're gonna hold, if you decide to participate, it's Stuart and I's, our role is to hold your hand through the whole process and make you do as little, make you have to do as little work as possible. We don't want you to have to spend a lot of time on this. So we're creating the marketing materials for you and making the onboarding process as painless and simple as it could be. 
we've already had um, quite a few phone calls and there are some gardens that are fully planning to integrate this into their spring initiatives so that, you know, there'll be every garden, almost every garden really wants to increase their visitation. And when you talk about visitor experience, you want them to be as comfortable and unfrustrated as possible, recognizing or being able to learn what the plants are and about those plants and whether or not they can grow them in the, your, your zone, in that zone, are all things that really make a visitor's experience much, um, much better. So, you know, there's a few gardens that are already fully on board for their spring campaigns. All right, looks like we have a whole bunch of questions and uh, we can go through them and uh, hopefully we get some good answers. First question here is what does PlantSnap do with the raw demographic data? We personally do not do anything with it at all, but we are keeping it because we feel like scientists will be able to use it for Here's an example. So there's a flower in the United States called the purple cone flower, and it is becoming extinct in Florida because it's shifting its habitat due to climate change and sea level rise. Uh, that's just one example of, so every year, scientists would be able to chart the time of year that it starts blooming and which part of which region, which area that it is blooming this year and then they can map it over time um, and they can do that for any species of plant anywhere on the planet and endangered species is where I see that they would probably start but in terms of what PlantSnap does with it nothing we just we just collect it and hope that some people a lot smarter than me will come along someday and be able to use it to help the planet. Yeah, and Eric, let me jump in here too. The demographic, I think the question was really more about the demographic data. PlantSnap is not doing anything with that demographic data. All righty. Next question we have, I think I could answer this too. How does the picture link with the location of the plant GPS? Almost certainly the GPS, yes? Yes, if you have location services, um, during the setup process of the app if you allow location services when using the app then the app will know where the photograph was taken but if you choose not to do that the app will still work it just won't map the photo to the place where it was snapped all righty uh samantha richardson asks if cultivars can be identified and does providing a plant list make this possible in some capacity? Yes, cultivars are the main reason we're asking for lists because we did not build the app to, by train and tra we didn't train any cultivars at all. We just went straight species level, no subspecies, no cultivars, no anything. And, and we realized that um, most botanic gardens have these. So uh, that's why we, if we were going to work with a particular garden, that we'd like to have the list of plants there so that we can train the cultivars. Because right now, that's not a main feature of the app. Um, related to that, from my own garden, uh, the folks at the Arnold were curious about a couple of things. One, um, do you want gardens to refresh the plant list uh, on a regular basis? Uh, because sometimes uh, taxa will change. Yes, as, as often as you change it, we would like you to uh, submit that change to us so that we can stay updated as well. All right, Mallory asks, do we have access to using all these features for free as members of APGA? Uh, yes, we plan, we have a, I'm not sure how to describe distribute it yet but there's a pro version like i said and the free version and we're going to be giving the pro version to the heads of the garden and whoever's participating in the program absolutely um i think you mentioned you have 25 35 million downloads but how many active users do you have it varies uh 
by time of year because it's a seasonal app. It's right now I live in Colorado and all I see is snow. So there's probably not, I'm probably the only active user in Telluride, Colorado right now. But in Australia, there's about two and a half million because it's summertime there. Uh, this summer in the United States, there'll probably be 15 to 16 million monthly active users. Uh, so it, it's really, it's, it's a seasonal app even to a certain extent. It's a seasonal app to the extent that the monthly active users change based on what season it is for a particular region. All righty, Juliana wants to know if you have a quick learn guide that we can post on our website for visitors. We do, uh, if you go to plantsnap.com, there is an instructional video that uh, takes you through every feature of the app and you're welcome to uh, embed that on your site. All righty, Veronica says, uh, many gardens have detailed maps of their plant collections it would be really great if we could leverage our plant maps to improve the accuracy of the ID by limiting the search universe to the species that are mapped within, say, 30 feet of the visitor's location. Do you have any thoughts about incorporating the location of the user into the search? Uh, we can't do that because over half of all users choose not to allow location services. So we did not build the technology to be reliant on the location of the user, because if we did, the people who didn't turn on location services, we'd have no idea where they were. So the app would not work for them. And then they would say, this app sucks and give us bad reviews. And I wouldn't be talking to you here right now. So that would be ideal in the, in a, perfect world, we could force everyone to turn on their location services and it would definitely help with identification, but uh, it's not a perfect world. All right, Juliana wants to know, how do individuals at our garden register their pictures as part of the conservatory as opposed to the user taking the image elsewhere? Once again, that goes back to the, having the location services enabled on their phones when they install the app. If they um, have location services turned on, then we'll know where exactly they were when they took that photo. Um, who do you work with to upload your initial plant names? Uh, we work with the American Public Gardens Association and the BGCI, which is an international version of the APGA. So we work with both of them for help with taxa. All right. Elizabeth asks, does the APGA receive funds if a person is using the free version? Yes, the free, the free version is ad supported. Uh, this thing, as you can imagine, costs tens of millions of dollars to develop and just supporting the current user base is expensive. So it's free, but it's not free. You still need to, you're still gonna have to look at a few ads to use it. And yes, they do get revenue from that ad, from that ad, uh, ad any ad revenue earned, they do share in that. Mary asked, what is the cost? But I don't have a, a context for that question. Uh, is, there a, is there an actual cost for the gardens, for the association? There is no cost to participate at all. Um, if she's referring to cost of the app, there's a free one that you can use for free. If you want to not look at ads, you can pay $1.49 a month or $9.99 a year to get rid of the ads. Uh, so hopefully that covers either one, either question that she might have been referring to. All right. Mallory wants to know, are there any features we can use to provide information about the garden or is this solely for plant information? Inside the app, there is already information about your garden unless you told the association to remove it. Uh, there's a search feature in the app and 
you click the search feature and there's a tab called gardens. And if you search for your garden, you will find it and you will see information about your garden. And if the information is not updated, then you can send it to the association and we will happily update it for you. It's really simple to do. Uh, there's also a pin for your garden in the app inside the map and on the app on the website. Uh, because your garden is pinned, we'll have the ability to send in-app notifications when a person approaches or is nearby your garden, reminding them, hey, uh, Denver Botanic Garden is just 10 miles down the road. Uh, that's one of the things that we're implementing right now. Stuart, I would just jump in. This is Joan from the association. And I just want to say that the information that is currently in the app about your garden is coming right from the member directory, which is the information you supply in your profile um, in our garden directory. So if, if you want to see changes to that, um, first of all, we call that level zero in terms of your participation because as part of the partnership, we wanted our public gardens to be represented on the map with pins. So um, if your garden, for example, has a super sensitivity to any of that and you did not want to be represented on that map, we can remove that for you, but you would need to opt out of that. Um, beyond that, though, any changes you wanted to include about um, that, you, that were front facing, um, make sure that the association gets that or that you update that in your profile in the garden directory so that we make those changes universal to our system as well as the transmap app. Thanks, Joan. Um, another question I think is similar to what we already answered. What are the cost differences to the gardens between the different levels? There really is no cost to the gardens. Um, Jennifer asks, what plant name repository do you use to keep the names up to date? Uh, you mean, there's so much debate about names and nomenclature. We use what's available to us through the association and through BGCI. They both have uh, giant taxonomy databases and they match to, for the most part. So that's what we use. All right, another question. I've heard QR codes aren't used by the general public as much anymore. Have you found that to be true? Uh, actually, the exact opposite is true now. It used to be that you had to have an app, a separate app to use a QR code, but now all phones have it built into their camera. So all I have to do is aim your camera at the code. You don't have to open an app or have an app. And we also provide you with a link to click on that does the same thing as the QR code. So you would have both options. Great. Uh, Jennifer wants to know, can herbarium specimens be included? Uh, absolutely. Easy one. All right. Uh, what if we don't have great internet service in all areas of our garden? Will the app still work well? Uh, if it, it all it needs is a data connection for the phone. It doesn't matter if you have Wi-Fi. It, it, um, when you take a photo, I mean, the photo is high resolution that you take, but the app condenses it into a smaller version before sending it to the cloud to be analyzed. So it doesn't take a lot of, it doesn't take super speed to get it analyzed. It'll go, it'll be, if you use a data line, it might be 10 or 12 seconds instead of four or five seconds. And All right. if you've got none, if you're out in the boondocks and you've got no cell reception either, people can take photos and analyze them later uh, with the app by uh, accessing the photos through their uh, photo gallery and analyzing them from their photo gallery. Great. Is it possible for guests to use the app without giving over any of their demographic data, sort of an opt-in or opt-out option? Uh, we don't know any particular person's demographic data. It's not the service that we use 
they strip away any names or email addresses or anything that would associate uh, third party data with a particular person, that's, it's a law. Uh, so the company we work with obeys the law. And if there's just like, if you, there's, it's, it's impossible for me to go, even though I can go into our software and look at a photograph that a particular person has taken, it would be impossible for me to take that person's name and learn anything about them other than that they took that photo. All right. And what kind of phone they have. I would know that too. Okay. Uh, Jacqueline wants to know, when you say that gardens will be provided with QR codes, links, and other materials, does that include signage and QR signage for the garden? Uh, designs for QR, designs for the signage. And, and uh, we're happy to help you build the signage, but we've got about five or six different designs for signage, posters, uh several other things and it's all going to be in a place in a dropbox folder for you but as far as making the signs ourselves that's just too big of a task uh with 150 different gardens that's not something we can take on ourselves all we can do is provide you with the materials that we suggest that you use and if you don't want to use them then that's fine too and but, those materials those materials can also be built into your email, your membership publications, your electronic ticketing. You know, that's, that'll be completely up to you, but you'll have the raw materials. All right. Apparently one of our attendees says that, uh, is there a way to correct the location of their garden because you have them listed at the local post office? <laughs> that is an association matter. We, all we can do is ask them to contact the association and <clears throat> tell them that the pen is in the wrong place and have the association send us the correct coordinates and we can fix it quickly. Great. <clears throat> uh, should we encourage visitors to take pictures of our plants even if they are identified? Is there a method of inputting the name to add to the machine learning? Yeah, absolutely. Tell them, um, even if the plant already has a plaque or a tag telling what it is, they can learn information. Most places, or I haven't seen a garden that also has a big, has a few paragraphs of information about the plant. So that's one way to encourage them to take photographs of a plant that is already identified. And it does help the algorithm tremendously because as Stuart was saying earlier, Real people taking real photos is how it, the algorithm learns because every camera is different and the lighting is different at all times of day and the growth cycles are different and the plants look different during the growth cycles. So the more photos of every conceivable angle and quality and lighting and uh, blur clarity, blurriness, yes, the answer is yes. Great. Uh, looks like we got four more questions uh, and a little time left. How do you make sure that users are not misidentifying plants? I've used the app and it seems as though you can make suggestions for plants if it is not identified or if you think the plant is misidentified. Does the impact machine learning? Uh, we have a team of botanists and we do not, uh, they scan, well, we, we're never going to be able to scan all 200, however many millions of images, but we get around to doing a couple hundred thousand a month and the botanists screen every image and make sure that it's been identified correctly. If it is not, then they change it to the correct identification and hit submit. And then it goes into the algorithm training folder. So they're screened before they are processed in the uh, algorithm training. All right. Can we provide our plant list to improve plant identification for the app and users, but not promote the app in other ways? We have some limitations around our organization, but want to support it. Absolutely. We're happy to, uh, more than happy to map your plants and anything that we don't have. We're happy to add them. Uh, you know, if, this is a two way street. We want people going to the, the gardens and we want people learning about plants and you don't have to, 
distribute plants net for us to want to help you in, in any way that we can. All right. Um, do you have any idea how likely it is that a plant is misidentified in the system and what specific types of photos are more or less helpful? Uh, there's really only, there's three rules. One, there can only be one species in the image. That should seem obvious because if there's more than one, the algorithm is not going to know which one you're trying to identify. Number two, the, it can't be blurry because even a botanist wouldn't be able to identify a blurry photo because the details matter. And number three, it has to have good lighting because if the plant is uh, green or the plant's red, has red leaves and you take a picture with bad lighting and it looks purple, then it's gonna screw up the algorithm. So those are pr three pretty simple rules. If you, if you follow those little rules and all it takes is, it doesn't take a professional. You just snap a photo like, everyone knows what a good photo look like, looks like. Good lighting, not blurry, and one species in the frame, and it'll be 95% accurate. All right, and uh, when you upload a plant list, how does the app then connect that cultivar name with a photo? Uh, well, if you upload the plant, okay, you upload the plant list. If we have not, if the cultivar is not in our list, we would then have to train that cultivar by going out and finding 300 images of that cultivar, feed it into the algorithm, tell the algorithm, this is X. Here's a bunch of photos of what X looks like. Learn it. And uh, then it, the more people take photos of that cultivar, the better it gets at recognizing it. All right. Uh, I think we're almost done. Uh, Carissa wants to know uh, about GDPR compliance and data privacy for users and gardens. We're fully GDPR compliant and have been since summer of 2018 when we went international. Um, can a user see your, pl your full plant list separate of taking a photo? Our full database is searchable inside the app. So you can go into the app and search for any plant that you'd like to learn information about, but it's not going to, you can't say, show me your whole list and have it list out our entire database, if that's what she's asking. And then I'll ask a question that came up at my garden. Um, if we wanted to get a collection of photos taken at our garden, can we do that? Uh, uh, can you explain a little more what you mean? Well, uh, if we wanted to get a collection of all of the photos of Acer Grisius from the Arnold Arboretum. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, great. Yeah, I mean, photo, we're happy to share the photos. With, I mean, they're, that's what they're for. They're for, they're for the gardens and public consumption and for science. And like I said, we want, our goal is to help people notice plants and take an interest in plants and ultimately map all the plant species on the planet so that people will start caring more about nature and this world we live in and helping your gardens is a big part of that. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, thank you. Mitch, I have one more question. Go sure. ahead. Oh, just don't press it. I'm wondering how um, the advertisers are vetted, if they're vetted at all, since this is a sustainability initiative. I'm wondering how you're going to pick and choose your advertisers. Uh, we work with Google. Google is our, uh, is our main ad network, and we have filters that we can put in place. And we're very strict with our filters. And but most of the advertising starting this spring and summer will be direct and it will all be plant gardening related. Um, so that's a, which makes sense because we don't want to show a bunch of ads to plant people that they aren't interested in seeing. So it's important for us to show 
ads that are going to benefit both the advertiser and the app and the person using the app. So for instance, right now, you can go in and identify a plant and we have a partnership with Amazon and you click an icon underneath the plant that you've identified and it'll take you to the page on Amazon where you can buy that plant. That's an example of the advertising you got. All right. I think we've hit our limit if we don't have any more questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Eric and Stuart, for your time today. Thank you for uh, hosting us. Welcome. And this is Joan from the association and I just put the plant snap at publicgardens.org site on there to remind people to take the first step. Um, basically, uh, write to Stuart, who is uh, monitoring the plant snap at um, email uh, channel and he will uh, answer any further questions about how to get involved at what level, um, what's involved um, and just start getting you going on it and we've got some great responses so far. Um, and we hope to spread the word um, even further through our membership about this. So um, on behalf of the association, thank you so much for, um, for participating in today and for asking a lot, many, many 32 thoughtful questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, and thank you. Um, my Vice Chair Carissa wanted to remind you that the TIPS community is a very active community on the website. Please come, please ask questions. And if you really have a little time, we have a survey that we're trying to uh, get a better understanding of what else we can do for our gardens from the TIPS community. So thank you everybody for today. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.